of things that, that just seem to be hitting me and attacking me, and I lost my job, and all these things are going, I get sick. Let me tell you, folks, do you know God? Let me tell you, God doesn't allow anything to come against you that he does not allow, that he doesn't give you the grace and the strength and the power because the purpose of the pain is to give you power and purpose to, to, to alight your testimony. It's not intended for you to just, sometimes, you know, there, there's something called self-preservation. There's a, we have this self-preservation in our minds we preserve ourselves. We, we, we go the path of least resistance. We try to run. I, I do that too. It's, it's an, we all have eyelids. If something comes close, we, we flinch. We close our eyes because we don't want to be hit. You know, if something comes against our body, we raise our arm in a defensive posture. We, we, live, we can live in a defensive posture. There's nothing wrong with having a defense. But it's interesting that God calls us to run into the battle. God calls us to be bold. In the time when we're under siege. God calls us to rejoice. He calls us to give him praise in the midst when, when we're, when we're uh, 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 opposed or the enemy's even stronger than us. And so the reason why it's so important that our minds be renewed and we understand the power and the purpose and the foundation of the gospel is so that you have the whole armor of God on so that you're able to fight what the Apostle Paul refers to as the good fight. Not a bad fight. It's a good fight. Everyone say good fight. Good fight. That means that God has an, an, a plan for you to fight. He does not want you to succumb to fear. He doesn't want you to just become some little closet Christian. He wants you to be bold, strong. He doesn't want you to be arrogant. He doesn't want you to be alone. But he wants you to be confident because of the knowledge that you have because of what he's done, first of all, in your identity. Now, I, I want to take you to a, a scripture here. I want you to jump back with me to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. First of all, I want to give to you, I want you to read this passage and just show you what Jesus said. Because Paul said, examine yourself. And what I want you to do, we're going to take a test. Because it's important. Paul says, test yourself. How many here like to take, the, take a test? Any man? <laughs> How many of you have ever passed a test? Isn't that glorious when you pass the test? But uh, Paul says we are to test ourselves. And like I said last Sunday, testing myself does not mean that I am measuring myself or I, I, I come to the conclusion that I'm a failure because I haven't done well on the test. No, all the test does is it reports what you know or what you don't know. That's all the test does. It reports what you have or what you don't have. Proverbs 28 says this, if a man faints during the time of adversity, his strength is small. If you faint during the time of adversity, when there's adversity, he says your strength is small. It doesn't mean that you're bad. It just means you have small strength. So here, when, when Jesus here was on this, with the Sermon on the Mount here, we find here in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, Jesus is addressing this, a lot of these followers, and he says this, Beware of false prophets who will come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're wolves. In other words, they have the appearance of a, of a believer, a believer or a follower of Jesus, but what they want to do is chew you up. They want to devour you. They want to kill, still, and destroy and notice this, verse 16. You will what? You will know them by their fruits. What Jesus, what that means there is you're to test. It means to test them. You're going to know them by their fruit. Now we're not talking about apples, peas, peaches, and grapes. When it talks about fruit, it's talking about their manner of life. <clears throat> the, the, the person that they are, you're going to know them by their fruits. And notice what Jesus says. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Really important. This is, this is the test. Examining. He says, do men gather grapes from thorns or figs from thistles? In other words, he's saying that when someone is expecting something good, 
How many here have ever made a decision, entered into a relationship? Maybe you joined a church. Maybe you started a job. Maybe you moved into a community. And you were expecting grapes and figs. But all you got was a lot of pain. All you got was disappointment. Because what Jesus is saying, that true believers bear good fruit. What that means is this, is that you're going to be able to feed on something that gives you life. People that are bearing good fruit should be giving life or should be producing life. The word thistle and thorns here in the Greek literally means poisonous or toxic. In other words, you made a decision in life. You made a decision and you were expecting grapes and figs. You were expecting some life to come. But man, all I get is stung. Pain all the time. Disappointment just doesn't seem to work out. That's what he's saying about these religious leaders. These religious leaders, which he refers to as false prophets, Jesus says here that these religious leaders had the appearance. They, they were the priests. That, by the way, they were the pastors of their day. These uh, Pharisees. They were the teaching priests, the leaders. They were the ones to be a voice, or had the platform to, to teach and equip God's people. But instead of bringing life to the people, their message, their manner, and their spirit was toxic <clears throat> and poisoning the people. Yet... The people still followed him. Jesus referred to them as the blind leading the blind. And they both fall into the ditch. How many of you know, how many of you believe that we need to be around people that bring life to us? That feed, nurture, that care about who I am. That when I when you leave here today, my prayer is that you leave here with some grapes and some figs, and I got some spiritual food today, and I've got something to go and build my life and get strong. Or you could leave here and say, "Man, just a sick spirit, man, divisive spirit. It's devilish. It's demonic. It's it's horrible." And there are sometimes we're in a relationship. Maybe in a relationship, you were really hoping to, and you were expecting something positive, but the fruit was not fruit. It was thorns and thistles, a lot of pain, a lot of disappointment, and a lot of toxicity, and a lot of poison, and a lot of death. Here's the thing that changes. How many of you want, want to see it? By their fruits, do they gather grapes from thorns and figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears four. And so... And what good fruit is. Can you, can you just write this down? Write these things. Five things. Number one is that if you're going, the five elements of a good test to testing fruit is number one, what's the seed that was planted? How many of you know that if you don't like the garden in what you're reaping in your garden, maybe it was the seed you were planting. If you sow weeds, you reap seed. Reap weeds. If you, if you sow weeds, with seeds, you're going to reap it. But if you sow something good, you're going to reap it. So I need to ask myself, what kind of seeds have I been feeding on? What am I, what, what am I feeding on that's producing the kind of fruit I'm getting? How many of you like to have good fruit in your life? I believe God wants to have awesome husbands, awesome wives, awesome kids, awesome marriages. Our church should be awesome. Our good fruit should be stripped to seed. What I mean by looking at the seed is I need to ask myself, what am I reading? Who are the people I'm listening to? Who has an avenue in my life? Who is speaking to me to the point where I'm beginning to, who am I listening to that is actually affecting my values and my decisions? Remember several years ago, my wife and I lived in, in Roseburg and uh, I had a, a woman come into our office and we were uh, on an, I, I just, I'm, I'm so fed up, I'm fed up. And, and I said, well, what are you feeding from? Well, where are you gaining? And she says, well, my girlfriends. Well, who are they and what are they? Well, they're, good, my, my, they're my friends. Well, I said, are any of them uh, godly women? Are any of them believers? Are any of them bringing the gospel which God intended for you to have so that you can grow up healthy and balanced. And she says, no, no, th those aren't godly women. 
Uh, these are just my friends. I trust them. And uh, their, their lives are shattered and they're broke too. And, and we're all wounded. And the only know, the way we know how to live life is gossip. And all we know how to do is tear people down. That's the kind of, and I said, that, is that the kind of people you're running with? Slanderers and gossipers and people that are divisive and tearing you down? I said, you can't grow that way. I said, you need to run with people that are healthy. Yeah. I need, I need, how many of you know if you want to become a winner, you want to run with winners? Now, that doesn't mean that losers are bad people. They're not bad people. I've made bad, I'm a bad person because I made a bad decision. But one thing I've really come to realize is that when I need to grow in an area of my life, I need to find someone who's been doing well, and I want to follow their habits. I want to listen to them. I want to be teachable. Amen? So the first thing is you've got to check, what kind of seed am I sowing? The second thing that's so important is this, is that we need to have, I call it the test of integrity. The test of integrity. What is, what, is, what is so important when it, when it, how many of you believe that if you're going to take a test, you need to be honest with the test? Being honest with the test means that you are willing and able to look at your life and honestly place your life, your thoughts, your conduct against the word of God. I need to ask, is my life lining up with this? You know, Pastor Ray, you get up there and you preach the gospel, you know, it just sounds so good and all that. But he, and, uh, I said, first of all, when it comes to integrity, the integrity, again, doesn't mean that I just simply look at all the bad in my life. But the integrity mean is that I'm willing to make an honest assessment about where I'm at. Am I growing in the fruit of the Spirit? Is there love, joy, peace? Am I blessed Am I living in the blessing of God? How many of you want to be blessed? I, I want to be blessed. Well, the Bible says that you will be, when you hear and obey, you'll be blessed. Do you know what's amazing? I was reading this uh, from a Barner report a year and a half ago or so, and they said that right now, 75% of most believe me. That's three out of four believers. Uh, I, I don't know about you, but, but obeying the word is important. But first of all, I, I need to ask myself, um, I need to be honest with myself. Can I be, taking a test means being honest. I want to really be honest. Not live in denial. Some people, by the way, being honest with yourself also means stop blaming the devil for everything. By the way, you know the devil's really not that smart. We give him more credit than he should deserve. We need to stop blaming the devil, and we need to take responsibility for our own choices. That's important. Because here's the thing. God can't change, and God cannot help you if you will not allow him to address an area that is creating the problem. It might be pride. It could be fear. It could be not denial. I remember I had a real problem years ago. Uh, I remember I had a problem with my father-in-law. I had unforgiveness against my father-in-law because he wouldn't let me marry my wife, Carol, in the beginning. Well, finally, praise God, we're married today. But there was a day after we got married, you know what I did? Carol would go to her mother's house and she said, Ray, we're going to go, aren't we, this weekend and see my mom and dad? And I said, honey, you go ahead, have a good time with mom and dad. I got things to do around the house. Oh, what are you going to do? Uh, I, I got to move on. I would make things to do so I wouldn't go see her dad. And it was an excuse to, and I was living a lie. I was in denial. And finally, a whole year went by. Do you know what? I had no peace. You know why? Because I was harboring bitterness. And finally, my pastor came to me and says, Ray, I just sense that there's no real joy in your life. I said, I got, I'm happy. I'm happy. And, and I wasn't happy. 
I was in denial because I didn't want to confront the fact that I had bitterness in my heart towards my father-in-law at the time. And I had to deal with that. Now, you know what? I wasn't honest with myself. Now, you know what the beautiful thing about the Lord? He is so patient and he will let you hold on to a person who won't forgive that they will be turned over to the tormentors. And I remember living with torment, but I was in denial about it because I didn't want to face it. And you know what? The one thing I didn't want to do is I didn't want to listen to anybody that was dealing with issues in my life. Oh, so I would run from the people that I knew was going to help me, but I didn't want them. You know why? Because there was a mountain full of pride. And the Lord began to deal with me. And I wasn't honest. See, part of taking the test is looking, how are you relating with the Lord? How are you relating with your brothers and sisters? How are you relating with issues in your life? This is part of the test. The third thing is this. A standard. When it comes to a test, we need to understand what is the sinners heading for hell. But Jesus died on the cross to let us know how much he loved us, to pay the penalty of sin. He took the death. He took the blow. He took the fall for us so that we would be reconciled to the Father. But that wasn't all. The ultimate goal was to transform us into the likeness of Jesus. And understanding the standard doesn't mean that I look at the Bible as a bunch of rules, but I understanding, understanding the standard is that I look at Jesus. How did Jesus live? How did Jesus treat people? How did Jesus treat his enemies? Did Jesus have bias? Did he have racism problems? Was he a sexist? Did he have a problem with women? Did he have a problem with color? Did he have a problem with his enemies? What did Jesus do when he was hanging on the cross, bleeding, the blood coming out of his body? He looks up to the heavens and he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Can we pray even when we have been slaughtered by other people? Now, I do believe there's a point and a place where we need to confront and we need to deal with rebellion. We need to deal with situations that are wrong. But that, that's a different situation. But, but, but the issue here is that God gives us a standard. What is the standard? What is the standard that he's called us to? Jesus. What does that mean? He wants us to be like him. How many here, you don't have to raise your hands on this, but how many here have ever done something wrong, but there was a still small voice that said, uh-uh, uh-uh, you, you, you crossed a line. You know, there's been addictions in my life. I've had addictions. And I knew the Lord was speaking to my heart about letting me know. He was letting me know strong, loud and clear. Ray, your body. Your body doesn't belong to you anymore, Ray. It belongs to me. I bought your body with my blood. And now you are to present your body. I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your body as a living sacrifice for him. His, how many of you want his presence in your body? I want that life. See, the test, here's the test. Am I allowing... The word of God, not just to comfort me, not just to bless me, not just to refresh me, but I'm allowing the word of God to begin to build the character. Make me a man of God. Make me the kind of man of conviction. Where I, I am no longer just settling for options. You know, today, Jesus said, I am the only way. Satan comes and says, wait, there's options. When God spoke to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, God put Adam and Eve and he says, Adam, of all the trees, he gave them three groupings. The group of trees, which was good for food. The, the second tree was the tree of life. And then the third tree was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He says, I'm going to put you in the garden. And these, this garden has options. 
Now, God put him in there. He says, but he tells them what to do. It's a test. God will allow you to be put into a test. And he's going to watch what you do. He will watch what you do. He will watch things around you. He's going to watch your attitude. He's going to watch what you do. He's going to watch what you say. And what he's doing is seeing if you are ready to go to a greater step for being used, a greater step for promotion, and a greater step for responsibility and blessing. But what happened? God puts Adam and Eve in the garden. And what happened? The serpent comes. And what does the serpent do? Challenges God's authority by bringing question. See, the devil has to create an option by creating and destroying the credibility that's in this book. He's got it. And says, hath, hath, God said, hath God said, come on. God knows that in the day you eat, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God. The problem is that Eve didn't realize, Adam went along with the lie, but they didn't realize that Satan was tempting them with the very thing that God had already given them. He, he had already created them in his image. But he was trying to suggest that they weren't in his image. That you won't really be walking in the image of power and life and responsibility until you eat this fruit. So you've you got to give in. You've got to cave. And so Eve, the Bible says, it said when she looked and saw that it was good. It's good. It looks good. And then it says that she saw and then she tasted that it was good. And that, that, that one would become wise. See, that's what sin does. The deception is it looks good, it tastes good, and it's going to make me wise. It's called the pride of life, the lust of the eyes, and the lust of the flesh. Those three major areas. And the Bible says that when Eve and Adam took of the fruit, it says their eyes were open. That means that they become conscious of sin. And when you become conscious of sin, it says the first thing, they saw they were naked and they were naked. They sewed aprons together. But then it says that when the Lord began to call out in the garden, Adam, where are you? What did they do? They ran and hid from the presence of the Lord. And that, that's what people do today is when you, when you try to tell them about the gospel. The, the big lie is when the gospel is being preached, the devil is speaking to them, says, you are not worthy. You can't come. You're naked. The Lord will expose you. The Lord will hurt you. You need to run from God's house. That's a lie from the enemy. And what the beautiful thing here, as we find in Genesis 4, is that the Lord caused an animal to be slain. The first sacrifice in Genesis, the animal, the blood was shed, and the Lord provided a covering for their nakedness. And we find here that the Lord provided a way so that they would not die in their sin. The Lord loves, how many of you know the Lord loves you so much? Is that when we're naked, he covers our, our, our nakedness. But we have to come with genuine integrity and openness. The, 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 the fourth thing here is this, is accountability. The test of accountability. Accountability is so critical. When Paul said to test yourself, I need to be accountable, not just before the Lord in my conscience, but I need accountability with one another. The Bible tells us that we need accountability. I, I want to read a scripture to you. Uh, this is this the Apostle Paul in the book of Galatians. This is Paul who had received... Uh, the revelation of God. He received the gospel. But here I want you to see something. It's powerful what he says. Because a lot of people say, well, Paul didn't have anybody over him in his life. All he had was uh, the Holy Spirit. No, that's not true. Here it says this in chapter 2 in Galatians. He says, after 14 years, I went up to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me. And I went up by revelation and communicated to them the gospel, which I had preached among the Gentiles. Now notice what he says but privately to those who were of reputation, lest by any means I might have run or had run in vain. Wow. Paul, who had received this light out of heaven, blinded him for three days, went to the, to the desert for 14 years and seeking the Lord. When he came back, this awesome apostle, the apostle Paul says, I need to go to Jerusalem. 
I need to get among the apostles and make sure that my doctrine is not screwed up. I need to make sure my doctrine is accurate. And he went to bring all that the Lord had showed him. Paul didn't have this arrogance where he, I'll go where I want, I'll do what I want. No, he didn't have that attitude. Paul says, I need to make sure that what I've received from the Lord, I need to make sure that the brethren, the leaders and the apostles bear witness to what I'm saying so I don't go into deception. That's, that's an important test. When I, when I ever study a subject, I always want to check with elders, leaders. I have contacts with apostles right now. Ray never comes to you and says, hey guys, I want to tell you what the Lord only showed me. Run from that character. He's dangerous. A loner is a dangerous, deceptive pit. Never run with loners. You want, you'll find that in the New Testament, the Word of God and the Revelation always works in the plural, never the singular. When someone says, the Lord spoke to me, that's great, but let's get a witness from other brothers and sisters. Let's get a witness by other brothers. Are you hearing what I'm saying? This is part of the test. Because the Bible says in the last days there's going to be winds of doctrine. There's going to be heresies blowing around and people will be taken captive and they will run to any new thing having itching ears. That's dangerous. We need the body of Christ. That's what the purpose of the church is. It's a family. There's accountability. I need accountability even as a husband. I don't want to just trust my own intellect. I need to bounce things off of other brothers and sisters in Christ. Let me tell you something. This is not a easy thing to say, but most people today attend church because they want a buddy for a pastor. They don't want a pastor. They want a buddy. God didn't call me to be your buddy. He called me first to be your pastor. Well, I'm out of here. Well, then you may need to leave. But the purpose, and I'm not trying to chase you out, but the purpose, the, do you know what the dangerous thing for? It's dangerous. I have to stand before God and give an account how I pastored and fed and led the church. I have to do that. That's not you. And God's going to hold me responsible. Even with your decisions, the Lord say, Ray, what, what did you do? Read, by the way, go back to uh, Ezekiel 18. Well, God gave a warning to the prophet Ezekiel concerning when I give you a word, and if you do not warn the wicked, he says, their blood I will require on your hand. That's not, that's, that's a serious thing. And so I am, I am first, of course I want to be a buddy, and of course I want to be a friend to everybody. Yeah, everybody wants that. But my first responsibility is to observe what he's put me in here for. And that is to bring God's people, the Bible says, to the perfecting of the saints, till they all be established in the knowledge of truth, till they come unto a perfect man. That is the goal of pastors. Are you hearing me this morning? Really important. Accountability. Really important. And the last thing is this. Is the last thing is this. Is humility. I can't say enough about this. What does humility mean? Humility really means that your life is for the purpose of serving. It doesn't mean you have all the right answers. It doesn't mean you're the tough guy or the tough gal. But it does mean that you have the same mind as Christ. The Bible says humility means that your desire is to look upon the things of others and to help them succeed. You are not here to make Ray look good. Ray is here to help serve you and bring out the best in you and bring out what God's plan is for your life. That's, that's God's mandate on a pastor or a leader. But it should be with, a, with all of us as Christians. Because one of the ways that I know as I begin to put my life to the test, as Paul said it, because Jesus said you shall know them by their fruit. Part of that fruit is humility. And humility means that when we look at people, irregardless of their problems or issues or even sin, we still believe the best. We still declare and proclaim the best. Humility also means 
is that we value. We value people in such a way that we are willing to wash feet. Remember in Jesus, with Jesus and the Passover before he was crucified and all the disciples were, they were worried about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom and because Jesus had come into Jerusalem and they hailed him as the son of David, Hosanna, Hosanna. And Jesus, on the night of the Passover, the disciples were still completely in a fog as far as what was going to happen that night. And they're discussing and all they could talk about is what's in it for me? What about me? Jesus gets up from the table, changes his garment, he takes a towel, and he begins to wash the disciples' feet. And it stunned them. In the Jew Jewish culture, there's four levels of servants. What Jesus did, he took on the lowest servant. The lowest servant could not and should not. They could not talk. The other three servants could. There were, there were different levels of status, especially in a wealthy man's house. But the lowest servant did not wear shoes, and they washed the feet of guests that would come in, but they were not permitted to speak because you were to honor the guests. So here's the thing. The servant that would wash the feet of those people would know where that guest had walked through, what they'd walked through, but they were not to repeat it. They were not to speak it because they were a servant to the guests. And see, when God asks you to wash someone's feet, it's not your job to go around and gossip. It's your job to take it before the Lord. You hearing what I'm saying? See, that's what it means to really obey. And, serve. and you're going to start touching and washing other people's lives, and you're going to start discussing gossiping about it. It's your job to bring love and restoration to their lives. Amen? Several years ago, when our pastor, Brother Dick, had resigned in 1993 or 4, he'd been serving for, he'd been serving for uh, 44 years as the pastor of Bible Temple. That's our home church where Carol and I came from. And he was getting ready to step out and resign. And Pastor Frank DiMaggio was going to be stepping in as the new pastor. He was a spiritual son in the faith. It was kind of funny. The elders did this behind Pastor Iverson back, but they decided to honor Brother Dick in a big way. And what they did, one of the, some of the elders, they decided to go down to some kind of a costume store, and they were going to put this big kingly robe on him, and they were, which, which had all this fluff around and he had this belt, this gold belt, and, and then uh, one of the other elders happened to get this massive eight-foot-long scepter that, you know, goes in the hand, and, and they were hoping that, that Brother Dick would put on this, they had a crown, they were going to put a crown on his head, this is just for changing pastors, by the way, but they really wanted to honor him because they loved Pastor Dick, so they wanted to put this big parade on, and they wanted to put this big crown on his head in this massive robe and this scepter in his hand and Brother Dick would march down the aisle like this and then he would turn to his young little uh, apprentice and hand the, uh, the, uh, the uh, scepter to him and put the crown on Pastor Frank's head. Well, guess what? Brother Dick heard about it and he says, that's not going to be amazing servant, such a blessing. And what we wish that you, you would take this as a, oh, uh, we know it's kind of, weird, but we just want people to know you've been such an awesome blessing and an example like a king. The Bible says we're kings and priests. You know, they, they really tried to work some scripture on that one. But uh, Brother Dick said, no, the Lord has given me a different model that I'm going to share. And he would not share what it was. Not until the day that the Sunday, it was a Sunday morning, and uh, Brother Dick we had a normal worship service. Everything was fine and announcements and prophetic words, things of that nature. And then finally, Brother Dick came to the, the uh, pulpit and he began to read that scripture in Luke where Jesus washed the disciples' feet. But then he pulls a box out. There was a box 
under the pulpit and he pulls this box out and he opens the, the before he opened the box, he turns to Frank. He says, Frank, the Lord has, has caused me to change the position. The Lord's directing me to move more into an apostolic role. And now the mandate is on you to pastor Bible temple. And the Lord spoke to my heart to give this to you so you will always remember what in pastoring and what showing brotherly kindness and love is all about. When he opened the box, he pulled out a shredded, filthy, oily rag. And what it represented was washing feet. And he says, Frank, this is what I'm giving you. He says, we're not crowning you with, uh, we're not crowning you with uh, a crown. We're not putting robes on you. But he gives him this filthy, dirty, oily rag. And he says, this is what you're to do. You are to wash feet. You're to love, love one another. And Frank took that rag. He had a massive frame and he put it up in his office. And it's a, you ought to see it. It's a ripped, stripped, filthy, dirty rag because he says this, loving people means that you're going to be doing a lot of wiping, a lot of cleansing of the filth. You're going to be dealing with their brokenness, their hurts. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Jesus wants us to realize, in spite of your mess, it's not about being crowned. It's not about pride. We're here to help people grow and mature and come into the knowledge of Jesus. That's the gospel. Amen. Let's bow our heads this morning to yourself. You know, Pastor Rhea, I know the Lord wants to continue, renew, and refresh, restore my life. And I know that there's so much more that God has for my life. I just, I just need to yield some things in my mind, in my heart. There's some things that I've held on to. There's some things that have kept me from coming into all that God has for me because maybe when the Lord's revealed some things to you, it, it, it frightened you. Might, it might have even called, just take down any wall. Lord, remove any wall. Lord, remove any lie, casual with mixture. Lord, I pray right now that you would just cause me to follow you and take up my cross and to pursue you in your kingdom. Lord, your plan, Lord, sometimes is not pretty, but it's right and it's healthy. Lord, your plan, Lord, is to you said that you're going to build your church and the gates of hell won't prevail. You're, you're, you're healing us from toxic faith and from toxic doctrine. You're healing us, Lord, from just to a toxic behavior. You've kind of been straddling the fence and the Lord's just saying, you know, I want you to come all the way in. I want you to surrender all. I want you to embrace and experience the fullness of kingdom life. As Jesus did say it, and he meant it, that God is able to do exceedingly. He's able to do abundantly above. But the blessing, that blessing comes who fears the Lord. If any of you this morning can say, Pastor, pray for me. I've, I've walked through some seasons where I need that. Any one of you? Okay, I see your hand. Anyone else? Okay, let, let's stand to our feet this morning, shall we? Amen. Let's, let's all lift our hands. Father, we just thank you today for the Lord Jesus. We thank Lord, that you provide a way for us. That is through your flesh. And Lord, as our high priest, you have covered us this morning with your blood. And Lord, you declare, proclaim us righteous, holy unto you. Lord, we don't hold anything back. Lord, we don't want to live in doubt. We don't want to live with pride. We, we don't want to pretend. We don't want mixture in our life, Lord. We want to be sold out all for you. It's all about you, Lord. Father, we thank you for the power and presence of the Holy Spirit who not just convicts us 
when sin or issues are there, but you convict us, Lord, even when we're walking the right way. You, you convict us that we are sons and daughters. and You convict us, Lord, that there's tremendous inheritance and promises, Lord, that we're claiming. Father, I ask you right now, Lord, to strengthen your people. Strengthen us, Lord. Yes. Yes. Lord, we just exchange. Yes. We exchange any fear. We exchange any lie. We exchange anything that would keep us from your very best. Lord, we love you today. You are the shepherd of our soul. Father, we ask you, Lord, to continue to build, strengthen us, and open our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Don't forget, God loves you. Amen. He loves you. Be blessed and have a wonderful day. If you would like prayer down here, feel free to come. We'd love to pray with you down here. Amen. God bless you.